Sir? I'm GT Hill with Nyansa. Uh, we appreciate, Stephen, you setting this up, and thanks for uh, everyone taking your time to come in here. Uh, so, cloud source network analytics is the best three words of jargon we could come up with uh, into one slide. So we're going to hopefully explain that. Kind of the way it's going to go is um, I'm going to go through a few slides to help explain the system. Uh, our CTO and co-founder Anand Srinivas is going to go through the actual, uh, what do we have? Product, Product. itself. <laughs> Um, with me today, also in the back, I have two other fine members of the Nyansa team, Mr. David Kalish. Um, he's going to just stay just like that, uh, VP of Marketing, and uh, CT CEO, and also one of the three co-founders, Mr. Abe Ankuma. You can say something now. Thanks for having us. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Cloud Source Network Analytics. So a little bit of background on us clicker isn't working, is, uh, so these fine gentlemen started uh, Nyansa in September of 2013. Basically a bunch of really smart people from MIT, um, Berkeley, and a whole bunch of great fine organizations got together, including some experience in the Wi-Fi space. Uh, Abe came from both Meraki and Aruba, and of course you probably know me from Ruckus, so a lot of good Wi-Fi heritage here and a lot of great education, so they came together to build a very, very strong analytics system. Um, you see some of the customers we have up here. I haven't updated this slide, but we have many more than 20 now um, in varying stages between deployment and actually paying us money, which is super awesome. Uh, we are not a technically out there public yet. The official launch of the company is the 18th. You guys are free to tweet all about us. Again, we appreciate that. And uh, I think that's good for now. <laughs> One of the things that, that, so this, for those of you that know me, I started in the Wi-Fi space, been in Wi-Fi for 15 or so years, and moving to the software space is exciting and also a little scary for me, that, that it's just very, very different. But one of the things that is really kind of, con, that combines these two industries is that we don't, none of us really like Wi-Fi client devices. I mean, we kind of have to have them, but they're a pain in the butt. And we think that, that they are the kind of the cause. Not, really, it's not Wi-Fi itself. It's just that the fact there's a bunch of Wi-Fi devices, a bunch of client devices, and they're not directly touched by the IT staff. You know, ThinkPads aren't being issued like they used to be. People are bringing their own stuff from home, a lot more devices, a lot more applications being accessed. So there's a lot more strain, not only on the Wi-Fi network, but even on the wired network itself. <coughs> One of the differences about us, or one thing that's very unique to what we call Voyance. So the company is Nyansa, the product is called Voyance. Think of clairvoyance, looking deeper and looking into the future. The Voyance software actually, as creepy as it sounds, actually tracks the movement of every end user, not from a location perspective, but from an actual protocol perspective. Everything they go through, from access to application, whether they access the network over the wired or wireless, through RADIUS, DHCP, ARP, DNS, and even the applications themselves, private or public, we actually see all of these transactions take place. And when you can see all of them take place, you can make some really cool determinations on what is the client end user experience. Now, I have a feeling that at Mobility Field Day, the term client experience is going to be said more than once. Not only with us, but with everyone else. It's the cool thing to say. One of the difficulties that we have, and I'm in the marketing department, but I try to pretend like I know stuff like an engineer. The difficulty is, from a product perspective, we're very, very innovative. From a marketing perspective, a lot of us say the same things. And I know that was the same way in the Wi-Fi space, and it becomes difficult to separate truth from, uh, from not so much truth. One of the things that um, I went to on and his team, and I said, hey, look, if the Voyant system could look at just one client device, what could it do? What's the power of it just looking at one device? And the answer is root cause analysis and remediation. That very simply is when you track that whole process that you see up there, if someone has a problem, Sam has a problem when he associates, he's on a Skype call, something didn't go right. Now, Sam, if he was maybe a regular end user, would call in and say, hey, look, I have an issue, it's the Wi-Fi. You don't know that, but you just know your Skype call wasn't very good. What's the actual problem? It really could be almost any layer all the way up. Root cause analysis within the system means it will tell you. 
It doesn't just give you the data. It actually says, here's the problem that you have. And it actually says, Skype is having an issue. It's not Wi-Fi, because there's a big green checkbox that says Wi-Fi was doing a good job. It's not the web service, because there was a big check mark saying that the web was good. But Skype itself has a problem. And then it says, next, it will give you remediation steps. Maybe the client, we actually would know if the client DNS is misconfigured. It'll say, client has a misconfiguration, fix it. And it'll actually say, redo radius credentials, input the right DNS server, or set it to automatically get from DHCP. So it actually says this in plain English, and you'll see that during the demo. What if you take that and say, okay, over a campus level, tens of thousands of client devices. Right now, we are tracking hundreds of thousands of client devices. And in the grand scheme of how large we are, we're just getting started. There's going to be a lot more. We expect to hit millions upon millions of client devices tracked. So when you see multiple devices within a campus or an enterprise, one of the things you can do is an automatic custom baseline. A lot of smart Wi-Fi people here. What is an optimal, not optimal is the right word, what is the average acceptable retry rate in a Wi-Fi network? Let's be realistic, 5%. not just say zero. 10%. 5%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10. Yeah. I think 10. 10, 5. Solid 8. Single digits would be good. Single. Okay. Stadiums? A school in downtown New York City? <laughs> 25. Smartest <laughs> Wi-Fi group of people I've seen in a really long time, and you guys aren't agreeing. No surprise there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the reality is, is that every network has its own baseline. There is no number that you can put into a system that says, if we go across this threshold, that's bad, everything else is good. So the Voyant system automatically sets a baseline for every network service. That baseline actually is, again, from the perspective of end user experience. What percentage of clients faced congestion on the Wi-Fi network, on RADIUS, on DNS, on DHCP? How many, what percentage faced issues? Then that is put into what is called a baseline. Now the baseline is what's used to have what's called incident prioritization. So Eddie, if you have a problem with your client device, that's an issue for me. But the truth is, if it's just you out of 10,000, no offense, it's not a high priority issue for me. I have a ton of other problems to deal with. So one client device is an incident, multiple client devices, changes the priority of that incident. And we're gonna talk about that more in a little bit, but the scope of the problem is not what changes an incident, sorry, the incident itself is not what changes the priority for us, it's the blast radius. How much is that being affected, how much is that affecting your network? Intra-company uh, reporting and trending. How many of you have ever made a change to a Wi-Fi network? <clears throat> how many of you have ever <laughs> wondered if it actually did any good? <laughs> or the reverse. A lot of experts in this room. <laughs> or the reverse. And you've made a change, and you're like, well, the book says so, my, my experience says so, but do you know that it had a positive change to what the end user experience is? We know that throughput tests and running Chariot and all that at one point in time versus another is really cool for lab tests by vendors, but it's not going to actually tell you anything for your network at that point in time. So we actually will trend the end user experience for every one of these services. And actually, you'll see in a year-long graph, here's what's changed over the last year. I made a change here to the transmit power, or I, changed, I enabled band steering, or RRM, just to cause some controversy. Let's see <laughs> what changed from there. Did it actually affect the end user experience, and if so, negatively or positively? The next one is... Can, it's a question, GT. Can you have that automatically automatically uh, learn that it was just if we did a firmware upgrade to a new code? Will, will it learn that, or do I have to, instead of manually, I made this change to RM, can it know that I made the change? It does. Yeah. So it will interface, we do interface with wireless LAN controllers to automatically te to annotate that change. There are changes that you may make that would be, you'd have to manually. I moved some APs, yeah. right? AP locations weren't good. You came in as a consultant, Keith, and made a change. Moved AP locations, let's put an annotation for that location in there, see if we, what we did made a difference. Because anecdotally it probably did, but we get paid on results. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll actually show you an example of that. So, yeah. And then, so, okay, let's go back to baselines. So baselines are cool. Let's say um, Lee's a great example. At Syracuse, Lee finds out running the Voyant system that 4% of his client devices experience DNS congestion. 
Okay? That's a real number that we would actually show. And, and Lee's like, you know what? That's cool information. Is that good or bad? Right? All of us, again, until you get a ton of experience, don't know whether these are good or bad. So with comparing multiple organizations across each other, this is the true power of the cloud. It's not remote storage and processing. It's can you actually look at multiple devices or multiple organizations and actually compare? You're going to see real life data where it actually says, here's you for Wi-Fi, DNS, DHCP. Here's where you stand. There's companies better than you and there's companies worse. And to take it a step further, let's look at what they did, what they're doing to make their network better. We can anonymously look at, oh, they're running you know, the newest Cisco AP that you guys just learned about, right? All the data is showing that that new AP really is doing something good. Or, you know, the bottom company is running a bunch of old Aruba AP 105s. Great AP, not really modern as it should be. All of that can be done inside the system. So this is to really describe if a lot of things you're going to see in the interface before we get to Anand's demo. So again, what we define as an incident is any problem. Any problem that a client device faces is an incident. But the priority of that incident is determined, again, based on the blast radius, the deviation from baseline. So this is a baseline in blue. The blue band is what is acceptable deviation that you can adjust, you can configure this. So over time, we actually see these data points. Everything's been pretty good, but now look at this deviation way up here. Normally, about 22% have a problem with some service, 22% of client devices face a problem. This is probably Wi-Fi being as high as it is. <clears throat> now 38% are having an issue. So that may take it from a P4 incident to a P2 incident. Something significant has changed, you should address it. I know I'm talking about <laughs> any questions or thoughts so far? How, how do you or? deal with um, the security of this multi-customers not sharing, but you, you need the sharing, but you don't want to share. It's fully anonymized. So it's a bit like um, medical information. You've been to the doctor, Keith? Well, we have all been part of a medical study, whether we like it or not. We have been part of it because we are just a data point. The way we look at from the perspective of the end customer, everything else is data points. You'll see it shown as company 32, nothing else. So there's no name, no information. There's not even quantities. You can't say, oh, that has 10,000 APs in their university. They must be one of these four organizations. But how do I, if, if I was in Lee's standpoint, I don't, I don't really want to see other big universities. I don't want to see a medical clinic compared to me. Perfect. That's exactly perfect because we only compare vertical to vertical, and then we're only going to compare like environments. A good example would be a university with 1,000 APs in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas, is very different than 10,000 APs in the middle of Cincinnati because they're different environments. It's not fair to make those comparisons. So through the power of Anand and his team, that is adjusted for within the system. And some sort of compliance and declaration from a trust perspective we, we can expect to see on launch day? Like, like, you know, like the, the fine folks over at meraki.com slash trust, right? Where, where they have a specific page that says, Here's how we address HIPAA, here's how we address PCI, here's how we, or don't, or, or we, here's how we believe these don't apply to us. Sure, we're going to have that. <laughs> we do have that internally. <laughs> Customers request it quite often. Yeah. Um, whether we reveal that or not will be up to Abe as far as that, but we absolutely do have that internally. Customers ask for it. We send them our security documents. At this point, we're still kind of NDA-ish with that kind of thing, with how we do everything, but absolutely we have addressed that. And we have, as you saw before, we have some quite large customers that put us through the ringer before we get to install with them. Um, the next one is symptoms. So if you have a problem and you know, want to know the priority of it, what are actually the causes of that problem? What are the, the contributing factors to this problem? And so you'll see that in the system varying, again, depending on the problem, you'll see what is actually working properly and what isn't working. Once you know the symptoms, what is the actual root cause? What is causing my problem? This is the plain English kind of thing that you will see. Skype is actually having a problem. We know that because we can compare data points from hundreds of thousands of client devices. Let's say 10,000 of them are using Skype. We know that because that's the power of data analytics. Cloud source network analytics, that <coughs> jargon in the beginning, hopefully is starting to make sense. 
the power of the cloud for analytics is <laughs> quite strong. And then the last is remediation. So whether this is one problem, if um, Brian calls in and says, hey, I have a problem with my phone for one client, or the network ops person looks and says, hey, I have a systemic problem with DNS, it's every one of them still has root cause and remediation. The last slide before I turn it over to Anand is, how do you actually do this? We don't have sensors, we don't have agents on the client devices. The only thing that's installed is what we call a VM software crawler. Just like it sounds, it's a virtual machine. Gets installed on your virtual machine. Um, or we ship you an appliance with just Dell. Again, we don't, we're not making money there, we don't charge for it, that's not our business model. That gets put into the system. All the data flowing through the wired and wireless network we prefer to get a span tap monitor port, something off of, at a minimum, all the data coming off the wireless system, preferably all wired and wireless data. If you need more than one crawler, that's fine. Um, that's built into the system. Again, there's no extra cost for that. The other thing that this, so this does deep packet inspection on all data that flows through it. The second thing it does is connect to the wireless LAN controller and we pull metrics. So you will see that we do not support every wireless LAN vendor. That's not by choice. That is, it takes time to integrate because we do a lot of integration with the system itself. So we, you're gonna ask the question, okay, Ruba, Ruckus, Cisco, great, well, who's next? What are we doing next? They're on our list and we're working with them with every event, basically every vendor out there in some capacity. You, yes, sir. Do you need centralized forwarding? You can work off distributed forwarding the same way. We can work off distributed forwarding just fine, but there, if there's a choke point on the wired network, that's ideal, right? As it goes through between single core switch or multi-core switches on a, depending on the size of the network, that's typically where our, people, where our customers will put the crawlers. The crawler itself can handle 20 gigabits. That's in basically, that's our standard form that gets shipped. It's 20 gigabits per second. We have customers with, let's just say, upwards of 10,000 APs. We've never gotten close to, to, to killing that thing. Ability to tap into any of the cloud services that are that are current or coming in the future from some of these, as far as the wireless LAN controller, API access to them, you know, like digging into correct. The, the so, data. so really, this is controller. The right thing to say is control plane. Got it. So control and management sure. plane integration. You know, the Meraki's Arrowhives of the world who don't have an on-prem box. Absolutely, we look at those as well. Cool. Um, and then the last piece is from an efficiency perspective. For about every gigabit per second that flows through the crawler, about 500 kilobits per second flows to the cloud. So it is very, very efficient. If you, you know, max this thing out, you're sending 10 megabits per second to the cloud. And that's a massive, massive network. It's quite huge. Um, the real power, again, is in the cloud. So that's, again, I used to think of the cloud as some magical place where people stored information and processing to do all this computational power couldn't even be done on site. Uh, that's one thing on and beat into my head. You can't do everything on site. It doesn't even make sense to do it on site. Having it in the cloud is very, very powerful. While I switch it over to Anand and give him the VGA cord, are there any additional thoughts, questions, you, feedback? Right, GT, could you just repeat how much goes to the cloud, did you say? Um, for every gigabit per second yep. of flow data, 500, 500. kilobits per second okay. goes to the cloud. Thank you. And do you have a do you have like an anonymous or a free collector that you that you're not necessarily reporting on that you can collect stats from people that are wanting to submit information for analytics, right? You're crowd crowdsourcing client performance, if you will. Yeah. Without necessarily reporting back to that person about how it's behaving. Was well, a, a volunteer data yeah. collector, but you don't pay for anything. Right. You don't get data. Just turning it yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't get data. So like. Uh... So you're saying we put in a crawler in yeah. your space, but you guys don't use it. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's not currently something we're doing. The reason we don't really need to is because we have a lot of. We basically have a backlog of people who want POCs at this point. So that's not. It does cost money to put in a crawler because we're doing all the processing in the cloud, and unfortunately we get a bill for that. 